Hi, welcome to Early Childhood AT, Easy as One, Two, Three. My name is Celeste Rodrigo. And I'm Jenny Pazmina. And we are both AT coaches for Fairfax County Public Schools, specializing in early childhood. And we're going to go ahead and go over the goals for this particular presentation. First and foremost, we're going to review the areas of need that are commonly met with AT specific to early childhood. We'll be going over behavior supports and communication supports. We'll provide examples of AT that can be used both at home and in the classroom. We know a lot of people attending are educators as well as parents, um, and we want to make sure that these needs are met in both settings. Lastly, we're going to describe AT for individual needs. So we will go over um, when to consider um, doing an assessment process and what that assessment process looks like. So first, let's look at the definition of assistive technology. Assistive technology is any item, piece of equipment, software program, or product system that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of persons with disabilities. Assistive technology can be viewed along a continuum ranging from low-tech to high-tech items. In this image, you'll see examples of what the AT continuum can look like for communication supports. So in our bottom left, we have our low-tech items that can consist of communication boards, eye gaze boards, or communication binders. And moving up to mid-tech, we can see items such as a single message communicator or simple leveled speech generating devices. And in our more high-tech items, you will see dedicated dynamic display devices or communication apps within tablets, as well as eye gaze devices. The first area we'll be looking at are behavior supports and ways assistive technology can be implemented either in the classroom or in the home setting. The first thing we're gonna go over are individual schedules. And most classrooms already have a large schedule displayed in their classrooms, but individual schedule is really something that a student can take with them around um, in their classroom to continuously remind them about what is going to happen next. So it really is a tool that helps them learn the daily routine and something for them to refer to to see the sequence of events throughout the day. Um, that provides them with predictability and knowing what to expect. Another great benefit to individual schedules is that they can show what changes may occur. So for some of our students, they do have difficulty with coping with changes in routines. And using an individual schedule could be a helpful tool for a teacher to prepare a child for that change. For example, if it happens to be raining outside and the student really looks forward to going to the playground, this might be a time where they will show them instead of the playground today, we're going to be going to the gym. And it is a way for the student to see, okay, playground is not here and know that that is what they're going to expect and to keep referring back to that to kind of prepare them for that to happen in the day. Um, in addition to the changes, transitions can also be challenging. And with this schedule you'll see here, you can close the tab and that checks off that that activity has been completed. And that tangible way of like either closing something, checking it off, or moving it over, taking it off, provides a way for students to understand that one thing is done and then now we're going to move on to the next. And a lot of these schedules have Velcro where it can be changed and manipulated easily. And the last is that it really promotes independence with our students that maybe an adult no longer needs to support them to know what the expectations are, and that's something that they do on their own. Another AT tool commonly used in the early childhood classroom are token boards. And they don't necessarily need to be tokens. They could be stickers, check marks, or other motivating pictures. Um, what I've seen a teacher do one time that I thought was very creative was a child was very motivated by puzzles. And so she found a picture of a Disney character and she cut it to make different puzzle pieces. And that is what she used as tokens for the child to earn to put the puzzle together. So you can be really creative. It doesn't necessarily need to be a traditional token board as the ones that you'll see here. And the purpose of token boards are really to teach and maintain appropriate behaviors. 
For our students, this may be their first school experience, so the rules and expectations at school may be very new and challenging. So a token board would be a great time to introduce to teach these skills. So for circle time, it may be difficulty sitting. So that would be the target behavior that we would want to focus on. And as we introduce it, we want to start off small, really, so that that child understands and can be reinforced immediately. So I might start with two tokens for sitting. And once I see the child sitting, they get a token, and then I see them sitting longer, they get another token. Once they've reached all their tokens, then they can earn their reinforcer of their choice. Um, and you'll see in the bottom left, there is a reward choice menu. It's really nice to, to be able to provide children with those choices, right? Um, that's what they're going to decide is going to be the most motivating for them. And once they choose, a reward of their choice that can be also placed on the token board so they have that visual to know what they are working toward. And token boards are really meant to reinforce positive behaviors and it's just a tangible way to show a child when they are exhibiting an appropriate behavior. We don't necessarily want to put on a board no hitting, um, no screaming, we're using very positive words and showing what behaviors we want to actually see. So in the bottom right, you'll see here that it provides some expectations of visuals of what behaviors are expected in order to earn a token, such as a quiet mouth, calm hands, sitting, and also listening ears. So the child is able to know what the expected behaviors are in order to earn a token. They also show the progress towards the reward. And the other thing about token boards is that they don't have to be used forever, right? We can really fade the reinforcers to a more natural environment. For example, instead of them earning a tangible reward, we could just be verbally praising them. Oh, I really like how you're sitting high five, you know, or giving them a hug. Those are more natural reinforcers that can be um, motivating for our children. And again, these are not just things that can be used in the school setting. If there are some um, challenging behaviors that you see at home, a token board that is used at school can be replicated into the home setting and it may be a different behavior or maybe the same behavior, but it can be transferred to the home as well. So in this video, we're going to see a teacher at Glen Forest, uh, Rachel Mall, and she is implementing a token board with a student. And what I really love about this token board is that she used a pencil case so that way she can have all her materials together, right? So on the outside, you'll see the token board. Inside, you'll see a timer. Um, options for the rewards as well as the reward itself. Love how you're sitting. Give yourself a token. I want buns. Did you earn? I want buns. Yes. Okay. Make a choice. What would you like? Buns. Oh, you want putty. Eva earns putty. You have putty for one minute. Good job, Eva. And a few things that are, I think are important to point out as we watch this video is you can hear that the teacher is verbally also reinforcing the child to know exactly what she's earning the token for. So she's saying, I really like how you're sitting. You can get another token. That student knows that she's earning that token for sitting. And then secondly, when she uses a timer, that student also has that visual and that audio to know when her time is up for her reinforcer. So those are really important tools that you can also use as you're implementing the token board. The next AT tool we're gonna to go over is task analysis. And similar to visual schedules, task analysis uses visuals to help break down a skill into smaller steps. And typically they are in a sequence. So you'll see here, there is one for getting dressed, one for washing hands, and one for going toileting. So they provide short, clear instructions to a child in a sequence. And a lot of times they focus on fundamental life skills and it's to promote that independence 
for them in a variety of settings. So getting dressed is something that they may do at home. Um, washing hands and going toileting are something that they're going to do either at home, at school, or in public places. Um, so it really is a way to also generalize a skill to provide that independence. And um, lastly, it's uh, can be easily adaptable to the individual needs of a learner. So um, 10 steps may be a little too much for a child, so we might just focus on five. But it's nice to really have these as visual reminders, not just to introduce and teach a new skill, but for a child to be able to look at if they're missing a step. The last area that I'm going to touch on in behavior supports are social stories. So social stories are social learning tools that use very simple language and visuals. And the purpose of them is to teach some coping strategies and appropriate social skills. They are typically written to address challenging topics or behaviors in a meaningful way. So for example, you can see a social story written here about calming my body. And really that's just to teach a child who may have difficulty with regulating their emotions to show them that having certain emotions are normal and then teach ways of how to deal with those emotions in an appropriate manner. For example, taking deep breaths or going to a quiet corner to calm themselves. Um, another way that social stories can be used are to really prepare our children for um, situations that could be challenging. For example, if they have fears of going to the dentist or the doctor, social stories can be written to provide some type of guidelines of what to expect in that situation to really prepare a child for when that visit does come. And another thing that I love about social stories is that they can be adapted to meet, again, the individual needs and the learning style of a child. In this section, we're going to be talking about communication supports. We'll be touching on no tech support, such as communication boards, and low tech supports, such as a single button communicator. The first communication support we're going to talk about is a core language board. This particular core language board seen on this slide is a 36 location core language board. Core language boards, as the name implies, focus on core language. If you're not familiar with core language, you can think about it as the most bang for your buck language. When you only have a limited amount of cells on a communication board, you really want to be thoughtful and intentional about the words that you put on there. Core language boards are great because they can be used in a variety of settings and a variety of activities. So for example, if I want to ask more, I can be asking for more food, I can be asking for more hugs, I can be asking for more times, time on an iPad. Also, core language boards allow students to generate their own language by combining some of these core words. Um, for example, you can say, want more, you can say, want that, um, you can say my turn, for example. Now I'm going to show you an example of someone using this communication board in a classroom. This particular video is of Megan Shapiro, who is working with two students on a core language board while playing. And you can see that one student will start with a single word and you'll see another student start combining words. And this is actually the first time that these, they are using these communication boards. Doing your job looking. You're putting that on. Brilliant. Want more. All right. More. Good job, Matthew. I really love this because it shows a student using it to combine words, and it also shows a, a student using it for a single word, word request. The next communication support we're going to focus on are mealtime mats. These are, of course, intended for mealtime. I actually really love focusing on language during mealtimes because it is a routine part of the day. It happens multiple times, which means multiple opportunities to practice, and it is a very motivating time of day for a lot of our students. Now, you can see on the top, it has um, the ability to talk about your feelings. On both sides, you have the ability to request or comment, as well as ask for help. And to terminate, you can see that in the all done. 
And lastly, they allow for food choices at the bottom. What's nice about these mealtime mats is you can customize them. So if the foods that are currently at the bottom of these mats aren't motivating for your student or child, you can customize it to make it the foods that they will typically request. This particular mealtime mat targets requesting, commenting, as well as socialization. This is a center focus communication board. As you can see right here, this communication board focuses on the toy area. It allows the opportunity to request, to make choices, to comment, and to, to direct an action. These can be printed out and hung up in different areas of the house or of the classroom. If you have a particular area of the house that you are playing, this is a great um, item to laminate and place on your wall. It can help to guide social interactions. And of course, like a lot of the other communication boards, you can customize it to um, either the choices or the communication preferences of your student or child. Now this is actually a clip of a news feed about a communication board that was set up at a, as a, at a school that I'm going to play for you right now. A ribbon cutting this morning at Malden's Early Learning Center signals the addition of a new installation on the playground. But this is not a toy. It's a valuable tool for children who are nonverbal. The symbols and images, along with written words on the sign, are what's known as augmentative and alternative communication. This actually allows them to have an opportunity to state what they want, even if they don't have the actual words. The idea for this new edition came from a parent. Now, I really love those communication boards that they installed because, one, they are really steady so students can interact with them without them breaking or falling over. Secondly, they are put at a student's eye level so they can be used for also verbal and nonverbal students in order to communicate their wants. And lastly, they of course focus on core language. Now the next boards that we're looking at are social communication boards. This particular social communication board is meant to be used during greeting time. So a student during greeting time can say, I want to sing or comment that that was fun or they can say hello or request a turn. This, of course, can be customized to any activity that you are prompting a student to socialize. So, for example, if you wanted to print one out that was about um, reviewing what happened at school and hang it up on the back of, back of your car seat for your child to be able to um, work on recalling activities and sharing about their day on your drive home, that would be a great use of a social communication board. Now here are our single button communicators. As the name implies, it is a single button. You can see from the illustration that um, some options is to request for help, I need some help, or you can request a turn, my turn. They can also be used for repeated phrases in books or activities, which is actually going to be seen in the video I'll show you in just a second. You can use two of these single button communicators to work on choice. So for example, one button might say, eat, another button might say drink, so that student can work on um, requesting eat or drink. It can also be used with one button saying more to request, request a repetition of an activity, activity or stop to request the termination of an activity. Now here's the video that I was referring to of Stephanie Scherer, and she is implementing a single message device to work on a repeated phrase in a book. Mr. Panda? I missed it. Mm, you sure did. It's a banana. Are you no, making no, cookies? No, no, no. Mr. No. Panda? Wait and see. It's a surprise. It's shiny. No. Donna. Waiting is too hard. Mm. Goodbye. What does the penguin say? I'll wait, Mr. Panda. I'll wait. So I'm not sure if you were able to hear that, but the repeated phrase was, I'll wait, Mr. Panda. And Stephanie was using that button with all of her students. So all of her students have the opportunity to either verbalize or to participate using the single button communicator. Lastly, these are our eye gaze boards. Eye gaze boards are meant for students who might have limited mobility and are still looking for a way to communicate. 
This area in the middle, this area that's called the cut out area, um, allows you to cut this out, obviously, and then you can um, see the face of your communication partner. Um, the student is then able to use their eyes to look at the words that they want to communicate. So for example, they can say, I want open, or they can say not want. Um, I really love that they put the word not in here. So it provides the student the ability to say what they don't like. Um, a lot of times when we have students who don't have the ability to control their environment, that not word is so crucial for them to, to share that they don't want something. The next area that I'm gonna go over are access supports. And I'm just gonna show you a few simple ways to make materials or equipment more inclusive for children with specific needs. Most young learners are exposed to touchscreen capabilities through either tablets or smartphones. But if a child is using a computer or a laptop, you also might wanna consider adapting a mouse. So when you're introducing a mouse, Adding a visual such as Velcro or Chrome sticker can be helpful for the child to learn the proper finger placement. Adding Velcro or form sticker can also elevate that location and gives that tactile reminder to the child. Other things can be used such as glitter paper or a plastic ring that can be easily attached with glue. And another component that you can add is if a child has difficulty with some fine motor and they're constantly clicking both buttons, you can also add a paper clip or paper underneath the right button to prevent them from clicking and activating that. And this really can just be used um, when they are either looking at YouTube to press play or doing some type of cause and effect on um, an online website. The next area that I want to touch on are toy adaptations. And these are really important in the early childhood classroom because a lot of their learning is happening through play. So we wanna make sure that the toys and materials that are provided both at home and at school are gonna be accessible to our students with specific needs. So these are just simple ways that we can provide that for them. Uh, the first one is a battery interrupter. And what a battery interrupter does is that it adapts most battery operated toys to be used as a switch activity. So you can install it to, for example, a bubble blower and attach a switch to it. And if a kid is unable to manipulate toys um, independently, they can touch a button, which then activates the toy in that example to blow bubbles. So they are understanding then the cause and effect that if I push something, something happens. There are other adaptations that can be just made with items that may be around the house or in the classroom to really just provide better access for our students with those specific needs. So if we have a child in our class who might have a physical disability or some fine motor delays, we might consider adding some type of page separators. And in the example here, um, you'll see a book where they've added sponges. Another thing that I've seen is people add tongue depressors to help with the assistance of being able to turn the pages and um, separate them. Um, some other things that I've seen in terms of book adaptations are providing textures to books for students with visual impairments. Another adaptation shown here is a light that has been added to a shape sorter. And that might be for a student with a visual impairment who needs to be able to see their materials better by having them illuminated. So there are a variety of different um, adaptations that can be made to toys that are very simple. It's just a matter of being creative and kind of thinking outside of the box of really how can we provide these students with the same opportunities as their peers and have them experience more and really build on their abilities. AT support should always be considered during the IEP process. There are two main areas that are looked at when considering AT for early childhood. The first area is adapted access. Adapted access is intended for any student who has limited mobility and is having trouble accessing their environment. Adapted access can look like anything from switch use, 
which as you can see in this photo, the student is using her left hand to activate a switch, which is connected to a cause and effect toy. This can also look like a head switch or eye gaze. Switches can be used to access toys, computers, or even environmental controls. The second area of need that we commonly see is communication. Augmentative and alternative communication, otherwise known as AAC, is any method of communication outside of speaking. This can look like sign or even communication boards, or even the single message communicators. For AT, AAC can range from a single button communicator up to a dynamic display communicator. The goal for AAC is to provide access for the student to receptive language that they are not able to express. The advantage of a dynamic display device is it allows for a student to navigate through multiple pages, which gives them access to a greater amount of language. AAC should be considered for nonverbal or struggling communicators. We have a lot of emergent communicators in early childhood. Some of them will be nonverbal and would benefit from a device, but students who speak or speak in limited terms and may be unintelligible can also be considered for communication support. So I'm going to show you one of my favorite videos of my co-presenter, Jenny Pajmino, using devices in her classroom. And I'm actually going to pause it at a certain point so you can see the variety of devices in her classroom. And this is, of course, an early childhood classroom. Um, so you can see here that this is a student who is using a twin talk to select between eat and drink during snack time. And you'll see later in the video that he will select drink, which is what he doesn't want, and Jenny will actually prompt him. Well, she'll, she'll still honor the, the message, and then we'll prompt him to select um, the intended choice. And let me pause it right about now. Okay, so right here you see this is the twin talk, making a choice between eat and drink. This is a communication binder right here. Uh, the communication binder allows a student to build using the selection of words of choice. So there's an I want on there. Here are his food selections. And I believe there's also an all done. And the student will select the words that he wants in order to request. And this one's a little hard to see. This is a compartment communicator. A compartment communicator is for students who are not yet at the picture symbol representation level. And they may just be grabbing items that they want. This has a little platform on it, which you can't really see that you can put the object on. And the intention is that the student will reach for the object, you'll prompt them to hit the button, and eventually with repetition, the student will um, eventually associate that button with the object that they are intending to request. You can then fade out the object so that you end up eventually with a picture, um, a picture device such as this one. Let me go ahead and play the remainder of this video. Okay, so you'll see in just a second, my friend here will request a drink. Everybody does such a good job managing this. And here's my friend who's working on requesting right now as well. You asked for a drink. Yeah, this is all done. More. Help. And she's prompting his choices. He's thinking about it. And she's waiting patiently. And she asks him, what do you want? He, he hits drink. She honors it. That's not what he wants. You'll see that in a second. It's drink. And then she prompts him to request eat, which is the item that he does want and hands it over to him. Now, AT assessments are requested through the IEP, and they evolve, involve a trial of AT supports or devices in order to determine recommendations. When we do an ATS assessment and it is requested through the IEP, the ATS case manager or ATS coach will then meet with the teacher in order to determine needs, work with the student with the devices or AT supports, and then make recommendations from there. We do take data during our trials in order to make sure that these are appropriate supports for their IEP goals. If you want more information, please feel free to visit our Fairfax County Public Schools Assistive Technology Services page. We really appreciate you attending this training and we hope you found it helpful. Jenny and my email and Jenny and I's email are listed on this page here. Feel free to jot it down and send us any questions. 
if you are looking for resources on any of the things that we provided today, a lot of the, the communication boards are actually free downloaded, downloads. We can send them to you. Just send us an email and let us know. I hope the rest of your trainings go great and let us know if you have any questions.